Good evening. My name is Rasef Masri, and I would like to welcome you on behalf of the Arab Student Organization and the Committee on Lecture. It's a great ple pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. I promised Dr. Shaheen to keep it short, but it's going to be hard. <laughs> um, Dr. Jack Shaheen um, is a professor of mass communication at Southern Illinois University and a prof professional journalist. He's a frequent guest on major radio and television programs. His writings, more than 200 articles, appear in publications such as Newsweek, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Dr. Shaheen, selected by the Department of State as a scholar diplomat, is the author of Nuclear War Film and the TV Arab. He's the recipient of two Fulbright Hayes lectureship grants. The grants enable him to teach journalism at the University of Jordan and the American University of Beirut. Under the auspices of the United States Information Agency, Professor Shaheen offers seminars for government officials and journalists in the Middle East. His lectures in, he lectures in Canada, Europe, and throughout the United States on problems and prospects of stereotypes in American popular culture. At present, he's working on a new book, The Hollywood Arab. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Dr. Jack Shaheen. Two college professors were out celebrating a basketball victory. They'd been friends for years, Wen Chang and Saul. And they had one too many beers, and Saul looked over at Wen Chang and said, I've been meaning to tell you something, Buster. I hate you, and I hate all your people. And Wen Chang was astonished. He said, what are you talking about? And Saul said, you know what I'm talking about. December 7th, 1941, you people, you bombed Pearl Harbor, you killed all those Americans. And Wen Chang said, but Saul, I'm Chinese. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Ah, Chinese, Japanese, Vietnamese, Taiwanese, seen one, seen them all. You're all like you people. So Wen Chang ordered another pitcher of beer, looked over at his friend Saul. He says, I got something to tell you, Buster. He says, I hate you people. I hate Jews. Saul said, what do you mean? What, why? He says, you know why? April 14th, 1912, the Titanic... You people sunk the Titanic, all those men, women, children, because of you people, they drowned. And Saul looks at him and says, Wen Chang, you got to be kidding, an iceberg sunk the Titanic. Yeah, iceberg, Rosenberg, Bloomberg, Goldberg, <laughs> seen one, you've seen them all. <laughs> I'm particularly pleased to be amidst a group of cyclones uh, here in Ames this evening. I want to thank you, Asif, for the very, very kind introduction. And would like to greet, e greet each of you in the name of peace and justice. The theme of my talk this evening is really to help foster mutual understanding and dialogue. I think it's best reflected by Dr. Johnetta Cole, who's the president of Spelman College down in, Georgia, down in Georgia. And Dr. Cole said, we are for difference, for respecting difference, for allowing difference, until difference doesn't make any more difference. <laughs> A much needed quality, I think, in today's world is understanding of other peoples, other cultures, our country is a microcosm of humanity, and no other country in the world is peopled by a greater variety of races, nationalities, and ethnic groups. Thus, our goal should be the expansion of tolerance, not the escalation of intolerance. We need to recognize and to challenge the stereotypes of the day. I don't know how many of you ever stopped to pause to consider the origin of the word stereotype, but I think it gives added meaning when we talk about it to understand 
that it comes from the printing press. For those of you who are journalists or spend any time in a press room, you know you have one plate, and from that one plate, many copies. Copies are all the same. And as a result, you have replication and rigidity. Replication and rigidity, a sense of permanence, so that you can't change it no matter what you do. The stereotype is not based on valid knowledge. It's inaccurate. It's acquired secondhand rather than through direct experience. It's resistant to change through a new experience. Mindlessly adopted and casually adapted, the stereotype acts as amoeba, flourishing in ignorance. And because of ignorance, fear, and misunderstanding, stereotypes tend to strangle one's humanity. Ugly myths makes selected groups targets of hate. Hate springs wholly from fear. Fear comes largely from ignorance, from acquired habits. The stereotype is, it's like a volatile gas beneath the planet, okay, beneath the earth. The weight of the soil represents enlightenment. And it blocks the stereotype, just blocks it, keeps it down. But when an uncontrolled and violent storm comes along, say the Gulf War, the stereotype springs up from the soil, bursts into flame, hurting innocent people. The stereotype is due in large part of our failure to acknowledge our common bond, our lack of commitment to the common good. We need to recognize the basic human, the basic humanness in each of us, that as a nation, as a nation, we clearly benefit from the diversity of peoples. Now, we sit around and we have a cup of coffee and we ask ourselves, do senseless stereotypes bring people together by championing diversity and global understanding? Of course not. Stereotypes are stupid, they're ugly and endlessly repeated, endlessly repeated, they desecrate the quest for human equality. All collective judgments are wrong. As Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel says, there are good people and bad people in every community. No human race is superior. No religious faith is inferior. The teachings of Gandhi and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., says Wiesel, do not apply to just Indians or African Americans. To tar people, any people, with a sinister brush is to do both them and ourselves a disservice. Finally, to emphasize the significance and the possible damage that a stereotype does, Consider the words of historian Carol Gluck of Columbia University, who said, I think stereotypes have the longest half-life in the history of the globe. They will not go away. Now, this evening, the title of the presentation has to do with images of the other, with primarily a focus on perceptions of Arabs in American popular culture. But before we deal with that, I want very much to share with you that in order for a stereotype to be successful, we have to create a boogie person. Not a boogie man or a boogie woman, we're going to create a boogie person. We have to have a target of hate. Now, I've come up with maybe 11 or 12 points to identify this target of hate, this boogie person. And I want to share this with you. One, it's someone who looks different. The costuming, the way they're dressed, unattractive, dark features, often in need of a shave. Two, speaks with an accent or a different language. Three, threatening to destroy us through our economic, through our economy, terrorism. Four, believes in a different deity or believes in no one. 
Five is anti-Christian. Six kidnaps or lusts after our white Western women. Seven is a coward, plays by a different set of rules, inferior, unable to assimilate. Eight, inept in the bedroom and on the battlefield. Nine, an uncivilized sadist, thriving on torture, taking no prisoners. Ten, boasts only when his hordes outnumber our champions a faceless mass syndrome. And finally, 11, the boogie person does not value life as much as we do. As much as we do. Sadly, for more than four decades, the Arab has been America's boogie, boogie person. If you study depictions of Jews in Nazi Germany, you'll find that we look on the Arabs the same way we looked upon the Jew a century ago, as a stereotype, says CBS TV's Jeffrey St. John. In stereotyping the Arab, says St. John, we in the West are shocked and surprised to find how potentially catastrophic such bigotry and racism can really be. Do you know that one in five college students today is victimized for reasons of race, religion, ethnicity, or sexual orientation? More than 100 college campuses recently reported incidents of racism, ranging from name calling to physical abuse. In this most highly individualistic of societies, some of us are judged less as persons than as types, and less as types than as stereotypes. I think as students and teachers and administrators, we have an obligation to challenge the religious and ethnic biases that create divisions among people. In reality, ladies and gentlemen, most Jews do not resemble Shylock. Most Asians do not resemble Fu Manchu. Most blacks do not resemble Aunt Jemima. Most Hispanics do not resemble Frito Bandito. And most Arabs do not represent Abdullo the Uncoolo. One telling effect of insidious portraits is that innocents continually become victims of dehumanizing caricatures. It goes way back. You know, Cicero wrote a letter to his friend in Greece, and he warned him. He said, hey, do not obtain your slaves from Britain because they are so stupid. Even then. Now, as an overview, if we look at different racial and ethnic groups, Mormons, for example. Roseanne Barr came out with a book a couple of years ago, and she writes in it, Mormons are a sort of Nazi Amish, end quote. Mormons are a sort of Nazi homage. Jews. Fifty years ago, sports writers were having a problem trying to explain the Jewish dominance of basketball. Basketball. There was a sports writer by the name of Paul Gallico, and this is what he wrote about Jewish domination of the sport. The reason I suspect that basketball appeals to the Hebrew with his oriental background is that the game places a premium on an alert, scheming mind, flashy trickedness, artful dodging, and general smart aleckness, end quote. It's interesting, I, I came across a, uh, I was reading a book about Henry Ford, because I'm thinking of buying a Taurus, you know, one know a little about Henry Ford. <laughs> and in the book, there's this, I, I, this is, I hope you're ready for this. Every time I read it, I, I have to keep a straight face. Let me get correct. Okay. This is a quote from the book. Jazz, said Henry Ford's Dearborn Independent. That was the newspaper that he created. Jazz is part of an international conspiracy. Never mind that it's played by blacks. The mush, the slush, the sly suggestion, the abandoned sensuousness of sliding oats, are of Jewish origin, end quote. And the headline in the paper on the front page is, 
Jewish jazz, more on music, becomes our national music. End quote. End quote. Okay, I, I spent the summer, I normally don't talk about images of uh, the Turkish people or Greek Orthodox, but I spent the summer in uh, South Carolina where I befriended a, a Greek Orthodox priest who was doing his reserve training out in some, you know, I forget the name of the town in Texas, but they were bringing over from Turkey a Turkish officer. Well, you know, the Greeks and the Turks historically have not necessarily slept in the same room. And so he went to the base commander, and this is a priest, and he said, you better not put this Turkish Muslim officer next to me because he might not like Greeks, and I might not like him, and there may be a problem. And of course, the Turkish officer came over with his wife, and he imagined seeing a Greek Orthodox priest with the top hat and the long beard, dressed in black, you know, chanting with incense, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison. And instead, he meets this macho Greek American running around in jogging shorts, you know, hi there, you know, how are you? So it must have been a dramatic shock. Well, to make a long story short, they became very close friends. Both of them began to, in time, because they lived close together, to unlearn some of their preconceived images that they had of one another. Almost every group has been in some way denigrated, humiliated. I just came back from Canada where I was lecturing and met a young girl from Pakistan, and they call her a Paki. A Paki. And she was giving a report in her class on what it felt like and couldn't continue. It broke down in tears. Beautiful young lady, labeled a Paki. Asians, a friend came up to me and told me a story of what happened in Atlanta. Uh, she was in a supermarket on December 7th, 1991, last year, the 50th anniversary of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And a man, she saw a man walk up to a Japanese-American at the checkout stand. And uh, he said, uh, you know, I wasn't at Pearl Harbor, you know, he says, but I forgive you. And the lady paused and turned around and looked him in the eye and said, well, sir, I was at Hiroshima, and I forgive you. Now that takes some doing to be able to all of a sudden unlearn and to put things in perspective. Stereotypes do not exist in a vacuum. The internment of more than 100,000 Japanese Americans during World War II in February of 1942 came about in part primarily because of the way media systems denigrated the Japanese over a period of time. The newspapers of William Randolph Hearst, the motion picture industry, and even today on 60 Minutes, Andy Rooney can make this statement, quote, I'm vaguely anti-Japanese. Don't ask me why, just prejudice, I guess. I'm very comfortable with some of my prejudices and have no thought of changing them now. And have no thought of changing them now. Native Americans, for those of you who are aware of textbooks, whenever the, there's a confrontation and it's between the cavalry and Native Americans and the cavalry wins, it's recorded as the battle of so-and-so, right? Now, what happens when the Native Americans win? It's what? Slaughter. Slaughter or massacre. Now, I ask you, would you rather die in a battle or a massacre? Now, Mark Twain said it best. The difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and the lightning bug. Massacre. What images do you get of people that would bring about a massacre? It's like Shelley Berman, for those of you who are into PG-13 type stuff. Cleans and dirties. Battles are clean, massacres are dirty. Okay. That's still prevalent in many textbooks. Now, let me share with you 
an incident, such, an incident dealing with color. One has to do with an African American in St. Louis. He's walking by an exclusive shopping area, okay? Somebody sees him. Oh, black man, exclusive shopping area. Calls up the police. Police come out and question him. He's a first-rate scholar at Washington University. They question him because of the color of his skin. Collinsville, Illinois, 10 miles from where I live. Mexican-American. Great restaurant. It's called Ramon's. Somebody calls the police. Ramon goes to Mexico a lot. I think he's in drugs. Ramon drives up to his restaurant. Okay, hold it, Ramon. Open up the trunk of your car. What's going on? Let's check. We're checking for drugs. No drugs. Color. An Arab American goes to Saks Fifth Avenue in Beverly Hills, buys a Chanel purse. He's snubbed. They won't take his check. Why? Because the clerk said, he's dark like an Arab. He's suing Saks. Color. Arab, all American, all American, and the color situation. The, these incidents took place within approximately three months of one another in different parts of the country. St. Louis, Missouri, Collinsville, Illinois, and of course Los Angeles, California, or Beverly Hills, California. Now, you say, well, you know, what difference do all these false impressions make? Well, I think it's the difference between clear thinking and confusion, between tolerance love and hatred. The stereotype also helps shape public opinion. Since our government continues to make policy judgments throughout the world, it's imperative for Americans to begin to think clearly, to discern between image and reality. Let me sum it up by saying that on Sunday evening when I was listening to my daughter sing jazz in St. Louis, there were about 80 handicapped people in the audience. And one of them was wearing a button. And I'll never forget what that button said. Attitudes are the real disability. Attitudes are the real disability. You know, we also have a tendency to fall into a trap by judging peoples of a region based on the actions of their leaders. Now let's pause for a moment. Don't you think it's dangerous to accept all Cubans as clones of Castro? Iranians as clones of the late Ayatollah Khomeini? Israelis as clones of the late Rabbi Meir Kahani? To equate Arabs as clones of Saddam Hussein? To equate Americans as clones of Jim and Tammy Baker? We have a tendency to do that. You people, you people, there we go. You people are all like that. Now, when we look at the Arabs, we have to ask ourselves, how much do we know about the Arab people? Most of us have never really met an Egyptian, Saudi, Palestinian. We've not been to an Arab country. Most of us actually do not know Arabs from personal experience, but rather from symbols as journalist Walter Lippmann always used to say, pictures in our heads. Symbols which bombard our psyches daily with hurtful images. These symbols are virtually all the images Americans have of other people. Ask the average man or woman on the street to define Arab. Surveys reveal we lump them together as a fearful mass. Uh, quotes like, Arabs have a cult-like religion. They're terrorists. They live in tent. Women follow the camels. Arabs believe not in our God, but in a fake makeup God. Yet the Arab world is as diversified as the Western world. Given this scenario, why do image, image makers tend to lump, lump Arabs together as a fearful mass? Nearly 300 million people from North Africa, Southwest Asia, the Arabian Peninsula, 65% are under the age of 20, 65%. The 21 Arab nations are equivalent to 50 American states, each different in cultures and local dialect. The region is one and one-half times as large 
as the United States. Now, I've been fortunate, thanks to government grants and, and lecture, lectureship opportunities, to visit 14 Arab nations. I can assure you, most Arabs have never lived in a tent, seen an oil well, mounted a camel, or ridden a magic carpet. Most are poor, not rich, farmers, not entrepreneurs, political moderates, not radicals, pragmatists, and not idealists. Yet our information about Gulf Arabs and others comes from a barrage of cliches. <laughs> Historically, the Arab and American popular culture lacks the human face. The journalist Edward R. Murrow used to say, what we do not see is often as important, if not more important, than what we do see. And what's ignored are Arab contributions to the society, to our society. Let me describe for you, for example, what the images are of men and of women. Men. Arab men are relegated to four basic roles. A Bedouin bandit, usually attacking a foreign legion fort, or a British outpost, as in films like Bojest. The billionaire, which is the Arab sheikh, who comes to the United States, pulls up at McDonald's, sees a blonde, blue-eyed, fast food waitress, says, you will come to me to visit my country. If she says no, he sends his two bodyguards out with sunglasses and they throw her in the back seat. Meanwhile, her American buddies down in the corner drugstore hop in the car, chase after the Arabs, beat them to, the pul uh, to a pulp just in time before they whisk off to, to Arabia vis-a-vis -vis scenarios of the movie Protocol and Jewel of the Nile. Bomber namely affiliated with Palestinian. In lieu of projecting the Palestinian as victim, Palestinians are projected as terrorists. The billionaire, the bomber, the Bedouin bandit. And finally, although this isn't readily apparent all the time, you see the Arab merchant, the Arab merchant, who's someone who's always out to cheat you. There's a movie called Appointment with Death, with Peter Ustinov, and Lauren Bacall says, the Arabs have a nose for it, don't they? Meaning cheating. They have a nose for it, don't they? That slur could never be really directed at any other group and put out in a motion picture. But the Arabs have a nose for it. When it comes to women, the image is even worse. Women are relegated as uh, usually walking around with jugs on their head. They seldom speak. Women are, for the most part, mute. Occasionally, we'll see a woman who's fairly articulate, but she's a terrorist, vis-a-vis -vis Black Sunday. She's a terrorist. The other two images, the prevailing images, are harem mages. Women are always subservient. I don't know how many of you have ever met an Arab woman, but I'll tell you, uh, this is a stereotype. I've never met one that's subservient, okay? Most, most Arab women are really strong-willed, well-educated, determined, I always like to, uh, you know, when you get in, women are really have a tough time everywhere and you start comparing apples with oranges. I always think of, you don't want to get into that. But I can tell you one thing. They are certainly not bundles in black that have no personality. And they're certainly not belly dancers who go around showing as much flesh as possible in order to solicit favor. But these are the images. Belly dancers, bundles in black, inarticulate, submissive, walking around with jugs on their head. Now, I tell you, these images have been with us. I'm working on a book called The Hollywood Arab. These images have been with us in film for more than a century, in literature for, for centuries, for centuries in literature. And in television, ever since TV came about, we have these images. They're repeated over and over again. And one of the things that comes about is that all Arabs, even though maybe there are, you know, I said 300 million people, there are approximately 15 to 20 million uh, Arabs who are not Muslims, but Christians. And you don't even know that there are Arab Christians. They're sort of excluded. But we continue to denigrate Islam. 
There are more than a billion Muslims in the world. I was telling a class, a journalism class today, that there are four million Muslims in the United States, more than four million. We have more Muslims than we do Episcopalians. And I said, is that good news or bad? And there was silence in the class. Oh, nobody knows. Why don't they know? Because they don't know. What's a Muslim? What's the Quran? What's a mosque? The ignorance factor. And so it doesn't help when you have things like the following. Okay, there are, oh, by the way, some, some facts. There are 46 nations that say they are Muslim countries. You've got 78 Muslims, 78 million Muslims, 78, 78 million Muslims live in China, 50 million in the former Soviet Republic. Now, most images of Muslims, when you say Muslim, most people think Arab. They don't think anything else. But most images of Muslims go something like this. A guy takes out his prayer rug, prays, and then goes and kills someone. Okay? Or after he kills someone, he comes and he prays. Trust me. Vis-a-vis -a, -vis a TV movie called Under Siege, written by, in part, Pulitzer Prize winning reporter from the Washington Post, Bob Woodard. Bob, bless his heart, couldn't tell the difference between an Iranian and an Arab. Throughout this program, an Iranian was an Arab and an Arab was an Iranian. Most Americans don't know that Iran is a Persian nation, speak Farsi, not Arabic. Oh, but it's so close, one student told me. How can it not be Arabic? It's right there next to Iraq. I said, what do you mean? I said, and, and this kid wouldn't believe me. I said, well, I said, look, Charles, we're right next to Mexico. What does that make up? Oh. <laughs> and using that type of logic, he accepted the fact that it was indeed a Persian nation. Anyway, you have things like documentaries. Now listen to the names and think if you replace Islam and Muslim with Judaism and Christianity. Think Judaism and Christianity as I rattle these off. The sword of Islam. The sword of Islam. The Islamic bomb. Can you imagine the Catholic bomb? You know? <laughs> Inflamed Islam. The assassins, holy killers of Islam. The fire, these are books and documentaries. The fire of Islam. The heat of Ramadan. Militant Islam the dagger of Islam, and holy wars. There's a, uh, if you go to your library and get a copy of the National Review, you'll see the November 1991 issue with a group of uh, Bedouin on camels. Big color picture, and the title says, The Muslims are coming, the Muslims are coming. <laughs> now can you imagine if it said, The Jews are coming, the Jews are coming. I mean, and they get away with it. The editor gets away. That's how embedded the stereotype is. Well, the Catholics are coming. The Catholics are coming. Good. Would they never do it with the Italians? You know, my buddy, I got a, got a good friend. He'd sort of give, make a phone call, but they'd never do it with the Italians. That's a stereotype. I better watch that. Okay? Anyway, there's a... I'll give you one quote. Just to show you how bad this is. This is Amos Perlmutter, bless his heart, writing in the Wall Street Journal. And this is what he wrote. The containment strategy for the Islamic holy war, it's about a general Islamic war against the West, Christianity, modern capitalism, Zionism, and communism all at once, writes Perlmutter. American policymakers, he says, must decide that our war against Muslim populism is of the utmost priority. Well, we were taking on 48 nation, uh, nations and 100 billion plus people. Okay? The image that's given to Muslims is this that they all hate Jews and that they all hate Christians. That's particularly prevalent in films such as The Delta Force. They all hate Jews. And they all hate Christians. Now, for those of you who study religion, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they share much in common. We never look at the commonalities that bind us together. They share 
freedom, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, social welfare, human rights with dignity. Yet, during the dedication of Christopher Columbus Memorial in Houston, Texas, a representative from the mayor's office, office commented in front of a large crowd, quote, we should celebrate Christopher Columbus's accomplishments for persistent in his efforts to come to this world because think how it would be if Muslims had beaten him here. We would be living under an Eastern, Eastern culture and that would be terrible. End quote. Images in popular culture speak. When I was growing up, and most of the people here with gray hair or dark hair that use Grecian formula, <laughs> there were three centers of influence. The church, the synagogue, or the mosque, the family, peers, and your friends, and your friends and the school, your teachers. And those were the center of influence. That they, they really, in a sense, shaped our vision of other people or helped shape that. Well, today we have to add another element. We add to this the media curriculum. Because we're, watching more, we're spending more time watching television than we are in the classroom. And disadvantaged children are spending even more time than they should be, up to eight hours a day, 10, 12 hours a day. And so images on silver screens making up the, the, this curriculum are really a, a force to be reckoned with in providing how we feel about different people. I took a, uh, two summers ago, I surveyed 289 secondary school teachers from five states. I asked them to write down the name of a humane or heroic screen Arab that they'd seen, ever, ever. Six wrote Alibaba and Sinbad. One wrote those, line, those Arabs in line of the desert. The remaining 282 wrote none. The survey uh, brought back memories of Oscar Hammerstein, South Pacific. Not a great movie, but one great song. There's a scene in South Pacific that when it was trying out in Boston, the producers came up to Oscar Hammerstein and they said, this show only goes to New York if you eliminate this song. And Hammerstein said, no, the song stays. And the song deals with Nellie, the heroine, who finds out that the Frenchman that she loves had previously married a Polynesian woman. She can't marry him now, she says. You know, because he had a couple kids. Colors are a little different. She says, I can't marry you because I was born prejudiced. Not so, says her Navy lieutenant friend. And in a song, he explains to the Frenchman the situation. He tries to explain. And it goes something like this. You've got to be taught from year to year. You've got to be carefully taught. You've got to be taught before it's too late, before you're six or seven or eight, to hate all the people, your relatives today, your media hate. You've got to be carefully <coughs> taught. You've got to be carefully taught. The fate of the empire depends on the education of the youth, said Aristotle. Yet our young minds are being saturated with images that show Arabs as proper subjects for debasement. I gave you where we talked about the images. Now, to make these images even more horrific, what do we do with them? We've got the billionaire, the bomber, the Bedouin bandit, the belly dancer, the bundle in black. Well, what producers have done and continually do is they've created what they call a mythical park called Arabland. Okay? Arabland exists in most films. We start, and you'll help me with this, it starts with a desert. 
All right, what do we what do we add to the desert? What's in the desert? What? Camels. Camels. Yeah, yeah. Camels. You know, I would tell you. Oh, it's late. Oh, I'll, I gotta tell you my camel story. I'll speed up the ending. I had a friend of mine from Egypt, and in order to break down stereotypes, he used to go before high school. He said, you know, we in Egypt and you and you in America, we have much in common. You have cars, we have camels. He says, we have camel showrooms, we have camels with one hump or two, you know, two hump more expensive, you know, special carpets, upholstery like you, you know, it's very, very nice. He said, in Egypt, we have camel policemen, you know, we have camel jams like you have traffic jams, okay? He's on my way to school, he says, I always take my camel, you know, I stop at the grass station to get, you know, instead of the gas station. <laughs> I get to the university, I park in the camel lot, you park in the car lot. Anyway, he, this was his way of, <laughs> bless his heart. Anyway, we're back to Arab land. All right, because of the time, let me, let me fill this in briefly. We've got the desert, and we've got the camels. We have a, either a military fortress, or we have an Arabian Nights castle. And surrounding that is like a souk or a marketplace where vendors try to cheat you. Maybe in the background we have the sphinx or pyramid. We prop it up a little bit with some few oil wells, depending on what country that we're in. Mm. A couple of donkeys and goats, some tents, and basically that's Arab land. You can identify it in most films. And then producers who work in props come up with what they call a, uh, an instant Alibaba kit. They give out scimitars and daggers and all kinds of different costumes so that everything fits nicely into this. And this is what we have. And, and, and this is what you do when you do intentionally or unintentionally set out to denigrate a people. When Nazi, in, during Nazi Germany, Jews were denigrated. Actually, the image of the Jew, I did a, a study on images of uh, Arabs in editorial cartoons. And I went back and I looked at images of Jews in editorial cartoons during Nazi Germany and even before Nazi Germany. And what the, what the Germans used to do is they used to paint the Jew, you have his long nose and protruding lips you know, with some saliva dripping down. And, and if it wasn't a Yarmulke, it was a dark sort of top hat and a black cape, and he was always lusting after a German woman, blonde, blue-eyed German woman, and he was in banking. He was going to destroy Germany through banking, okay? And his God was different than their God. And if you look at the Arab, the same face, the hooked nose, the Arab shake, the hooked nose, the protruding lips, the saliva, the headdress, the robe, and instead of Instead of banking, it's oil. But the lust and the object of his attention is the same. And again, his religion is different from our religion. So the similarities are frightening. Now, why do we have stereotypes? Briefly, and then we'll have a Q&A. Ignorance, we simply don't know. Indolence, we're lazy, we don't care. Indifference, part of the same package. We have the stereotype because of Islam. We simply don't know much about the religion. Because of apathy, because of greed, if we can make money denigrating someone, we'll do it. Because of politics, the Arab-Israeli conflict plays a role. And finally, I think it's a lack of being able to understand the significance and the importance of what damage a stereotype does. Now, Jesse Jackson wrote not too long ago that America is not like a blanket, one piece of unbroken cloth, the same color, the same texture, the same size. America, said Jesse, is more like a quilt, many pieces, many colors, Many sides is all woven together and held by a common thread. I think Jackson's quilt metaphor is a good one because the quilt really is infinitely more viable, more attractive, is it not, 
than each single patch would be by itself. I want to quote a friend of mine that I met in Los Angeles four years ago. He's a television producer, writer by the name of Ted Flicker, who's an advocate of responsibility in the industry. And he spoke out against Arab bashing before the boards of directors of both the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild. This is what Flicker said. For those of us who remember what it was like to be Jewish in the 30s and 40s, stereotypes were part of the process that separated us, American Jews, from the rest of the community. They were the cause of schoolyard fights and psychological scars that many of us carry today, adds Flicker. I think honor requires that we, the maker of our nation's myths, consider the plight of these people and help get rid of the Arab stereotype, end quote. In his autobiography, Carl Sandburg writes of the renewal of society in every generation of young strangers. And I think by young strangers he meant young people, uh, very much like yourselves. Because really, I think you have the ability to lead your contemporaries and to renew the values that sustain this planet. In Chinese, the word crisis has two elements, danger and opportunity. The Gulf War poses a danger that prejudicial portraits will continue to divide us, but the war also poses an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity to recognize, said Margaret Mead. In fact, said Mead, that's the only way it's ever happened. Ron Kovic, author of Born on the Fourth of July, says it best. Hey, let's all step into a new age, the age of reason. He's right. I think we are in a new age, and it's up to us to make it work. If not, if we see an injustice, and if you don't act, and I don't act, then who? And if not now, at this moment, then when? I think it's a challenge to become an agent of liberation, championing the cause of humanism, charity, kindness. I think together we can make human ideals and human values a reality. Whatever affects one directly, said Dr. King, affects all indirectly. Let us care about one another, and not only those of our own clan, or class, or color. Just because you're a woman and a woman's denigrated, don't think I care only about women. Or because you have Polish roots, you care only about someone who's Polish. Or because, you know, you're, that's self-destructive. We have to expand that to care about others. Dr. King's words act as a symbol of a unifying dream, hoping that our stereotypes will be swept clean, our minds rededicated, and our souls redeemed. Know with Dr. King that we can't overcome. Know that with Socrates, that one who injures another injures himself or herself spiritually. And know with Aristotle that hope, hope is a waking dream. And in shared hopes and in shared dreams, we can overcome the injustice of stereotyping. I want to, uh, to thank you for having me uh, here in Ames. It's my first trip. And until we meet again, uh, I simply like to extend a hand of friendship and of appreciation to each and every one of you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll be glad to uh, answer any questions you might have. I do have a, a six-minute <laughs> clip from the cassette, and that I, because of the time factor, I didn't show it. If you'd like to see it, I'd be happy to show it, or we can just uh, fire away on a couple of questions that you might have. 
Why don't we take questions for a few minutes, and those who want to stay, I'll show the cassette. It's only a six-minute clip from the Today Show. Any questions? Well, I'll show the clip. 